Hi, my name is Tom Melcher. This is the first in a nine-part Guild Academy series. We hope that the curriculum will be what beginning woodworkers are looking for and longtime woodworkers can appreciate and learn from. Fifteen years ago, I remember conversations that woodworking as a hobby was disappearing. Now, because of the internet, YouTube and social media, plus modern machines and boutique tools, woodworking and makers groups are booming again. I assume everyone's here because they have an interest in woodworking, so I won't ask why or the reasons for your interest. As for myself, I took woodworking classes in high school, and I've called myself a woodworker all my life, although most of my adult life was spent working and raising a family. I only got serious about woodworking about 10 years ago. In the end, we're all on the same journey with the love for woodworking. Some are just starting and others are much further along. I've used many resources to put this presentation together. Some will be mentioned as I go. Two books I highly recommend, both by Michael Pekovich of Fine Woodworking, are The Why and How of Woodworking, and the recently published Foundations of Woodworking. Both are really good if you're thinking about getting into the hobby as well as for woodworkers looking for a better path. So what do I mean when I say developing your strategy? In thinking about this, there's actually multiple strategies to consider. But I want to start at ground zero by helping you determine what your goals as a woodworker might be. If you're starting out, you probably don't have a goal. If you do, more power to you. But most likely, your goal will dramatically change as you learn the craft. That's because learning is never-ending. So through the learning process, you'll most likely find what you're looking for. A few might want to take your skills and make this a full-time career in the wood industry that can provide a secure job and good income. I can provide some links for more information if you like. But most of us are hobbyists, not professionals. So your goal may simply be to learn the craft and have a place to putz around in your spare time with no goal in mind whatsoever. More likely, you may be an avid do-it-yourselfer who repairs things around the house. And occasionally, you take a stab at building something out of wood to save money. Or you've made a couple of pieces of furniture and want to continue doing that for family and friends. You may have a mentally demanding job and you need a place to decompress. And woodworking can certainly do that for you. If you're approaching retirement or are retired, you might be looking for a hobby or even supplementary income. What happens for many of us is that if you get really bitten by the woodworking bug, you'll most likely start specializing in one or even several aspects of woodworking. As Steve Ramsey with Woodworking for Mere Mortals says, it's certainly plausible that you could make money selling to a discerning clientele willing to pay premium prices for quality craftsmanship and one-of-a-kind pieces. On the other hand, you could make smaller, less time-consuming projects to sell to a greater number of customers at craft fairs or on Etsy, end quote. Here's an interesting goal at the opposite end of the spectrum that I discovered. You could become a YouTuber. Did you know that you can make around $100,000 a year? with about 200,000 subscribers after a few years of work. That includes affiliate marketing and Google AdSense. You can double that by also selling goods and merchandise, sponsorships and endorsements, but it's a full-time job. Many of us have goals to simply make enough money so that we can equip our shops and buy tools. Many of us don't make any money at all and still spend a lot of money on tools. More on that later. So how do you become a really good woodworker? Since the specific journey, as previously mentioned, can be complicated, becoming a good woodworker is unique for each one of us. For most, woodworking is a solitary sport. Maybe that's part of the attraction. But what's wonderful about it is that it's a sport that is open to everyone, regardless of age, race, gender, or handicap. 
Yes, I've known woodworkers in wheelchairs or without an arm or hand. I know a very talented woodcarver here in Atlanta, Jorge Posada, that lost most of his fingers on one hand in a table saw accident. Did I say he was a talented carver? Here's a photo he just sent me of an eagle carved from black walnut. It's amazing. You should see it close up. By the way, our May Guild Academy class is on safety. So how do you become a good woodworker? You might be fortunate enough to have a mentor. As a matter of fact, the Guild has a mentoring program. Check out our website for more information. You can read books and take classes. Woodworking classes are a great way to learn woodworking as most of them are hands-on. There are a number of schools around the country that you can enroll in for a few days or weeks or longer. Again, check out our website for a list of woodworking schools. Many watch YouTube, which is a terrific resource because it attracts you to the craft and entertains you at the same time. Woodworking is a very vibrant community and there are many woodworking podcasts and most every specialty available to listen to while you work or drive. On the Guild website under the Education tab, we are continuously updating a list of tours, podcasts, websites, and curated YouTube videos. And if you haven't already, you can join a Woodworkers Guild. You knew I was going to say that at some point, right? But with all those resources, including watching YouTube videos, you won't get good until you get in the shop and start making sawdust. I don't care if it's making a sandpaper station, a place to store drills and batteries, or making jigs. You need to make stuff. Problem solve and make mistakes. Mistakes, you say? Yes, even the best woodworkers make mistakes on a continuous basis. The trick is to either make the mistake a feature or just move on and make a duplicate part. That's why everyone says to buy extra wood. Jimmy Duresta says, get out of your comfort zone. That's how you learn and get better. Stop thinking about it and start making stuff. Anything. Just start making sawdust. Earlier we were talking about specialties. I call them rabbit holes. And there's many of them. And you can certainly have more than one. Here's a rabbit hole poem to give you some inspiration. You can make furniture from period to modern to shaker. Make dog and cat beds or human beds from cedar. Birdhouses, boats, and wooden utensils. You can even specialize in making wooden pencils. Build tables and chairs and nightstands in pairs or become one of a few master luthiers. End tables, bookcases, plant stands, and wine racks, veneering and wall cabinets with various knickknacks. Make pens and bowls through the art of wood turning, plus boxes, cutting boards, toys, or chip carving. You can specialize in scroll sawing, kumiko and marquetry, or learn Japanese joinery or wood burning parquetry. So if you get bored woodworking one day, just read this poem and find a new pathway. Let's talk about shop strategy. Where can you have a shop? Do I even have room for a shop? In my opinion, no shop is too small. I've seen people starting basic hand tool woodworking in a spare bedroom, kitchen, or even under a stairwell. If you have a garage, that's the obvious place to start. On the other hand, any shop size is never enough. I started in a small two-car garage working around the cars. Then a two-car garage with no cars. Now I have about a thousand square foot dedicated shop attached to my house. Keep in mind, this took me about 40 years to get there. So be patient. Yes, a shop can be a money pit, but that's because a shop is never complete. Start small with any available space you have and work your way up from there. So here's some strategies to help you get equipped in your shop. But first, a little woodworking history. 
About 2,000 years ago, woodworkers became a very important part of society for many early civilizations. Ancient tools used were the saw, mallet, adze, plummet and line, chisel, rule stick, plane, square, and bow drill. There was no such thing as power tools, yet their woodworking was elaborate and minutely detailed. Skipping forward in the 11th to 13th centuries, woodworking evolved into guilds with classes of woodworkers, from masters to journeymen to apprentices. This class system was a practical way to learn principles and skills, and apprentices excelled by learning from the shop floor or the building site through long-term observation and practice. This reinforces the idea that watching YouTube videos or reading books will not make you a good woodworker. You have to get in your shop and be hands-on, just as the apprentices did. Historically speaking, apprentices were given the more difficult work. It also allowed the masters to focus on more skilled and detailed work. Now this brings up a couple of really good questions. The first, do you want to be a hand tool only woodworker? Like the ancients and the guilds of the past? There are many benefits to using hand tools. The swoosh of a hand plane, the rhythm of a hand saw, and the tapping on a chisel with a mallet is wholesomely satisfying and brings calm and peace for many. Hand tools are quieter, safer, and they create less dust, and they improve accuracy. Hand tools can also save you a lot of money versus their powered counterparts. If you live in an apartment or have small children, hand tools will allow you to work even into the night. So while there are many advantages to woodworking with only traditional hand tools, it's a lot more work and most do not choose this route. The use of a handsaw to resaw a board could be considered by some a cult and a lot of hard work. But it is a choice, and it's up to you to determine whether the advantages of hand tool only woodworking outweigh the disadvantages for your particular situation. You can certainly evolve over time and incorporate power tools into your workflow. Many have done so, becoming what is called a hybrid woodworker. More on that in a minute. The second question is the use of technology which is a separate and different discussion from being a hand tool only woodworker, although both have similarities. As mentioned earlier, the old masters chose to let the apprentices do the hardest work. And with the evolution of technology from water to steam and then to electricity, woodworkers embraced that technology to make their work easier, thereby increasing efficiency. Centuries ago, apprentices used a pit saw to cut boards from a log. Today it's easily done with a bandsaw mill. Do you think those apprentices would have continued to use a pit saw if they had access to a bandsaw mill? Probably not. Do you think the masters would have allowed the apprentices to continue using a pit saw? Certainly not. With technology, many tools from yesteryear have a modern day power tool equivalent. Examples would be a jointer being equivalent to an upside down bench plane with a motorized blade. A bandsaw is the modern day equivalent of the traditional frame saw. Random orbital sanders do the work previously assigned to smoothing planes. Mark Spagnuolo, also known as the Wood Whisperer, uses the term hybrid in his book, Hybrid Woodworking. He embraces the use of both hand tools and power tools as they are closely interconnected. Mark makes the observation that most new woodworkers start out with power tools as that is what is seen on DIY TV and in real life where there is little appreciation for traditional hand tool woodworking. The beauty of hybrid woodworking is that you can have all the benefits of hand tools and still have power tools to do the grunt work. After all, the typical woodworker doesn't have an apprentice. Some people might say that hand tool woodworking is more skilled. Others may say that the skill and concentration required to saw a fair curve at the bandsaw is equal to that required by just about any other tool in the shop, powered or unpowered. 
You can have a personal relationship with a table saw or jointer, just as you have with a chisel or a hand plane. So what are some strategies to get all of these tools? When you need a lot of tools, you either need a lot of money, you need to buy inexpensive, or you buy them over a long period of time. Inexpensive is different from cheap. More on that later. First of all, you don't need every tool in existence to have a functional wood shop or to do woodworking. I started with a Sears circular saw, drill, radio alarm saw, and various DIY tools, and added a router and disc belt sander, of which I still have to this day. I did not see a need for hand planes, as evidenced by my first bench made from 2x4s and nails, which is still used today as a stand for my planer. If you're just starting out, all you need is a circular saw, tape measure, some glue, some wood, a pencil, and the will to make something. As soon as you make that first cut, you are officially a woodworker. You also don't need to buy everything brand new. You can find inexpensive used tools by searching on Craigslist and eBay. You can also visit estate sales, garage sales, pawn shops, and flea markets, but this can still be hit or miss and a lot of work. You can make some of your power tools. Check out Matthias Wandel or Izzy Swan on YouTube. I saw this saying at Highland Woodworking many years ago. He who dies with the most tools wins. For those among us that are crazed tool buyers, the quality of their tools can exceed the quality of their work. I chuckle to myself every time I watch a YouTube video and see half a dozen red woodpecker squares costing hundreds and hundreds of dollars mounted to the wall behind them. I'm not making fun of them because I'd love to have all those squares mounted on my wall too. So what I suggest is to buy tools as you need them and to buy the best tool you can afford at the time. Don't be impulsive because you want it or buy because it's on sale. And I've done both of those. Buy tools that you need that either speeds up your process or fulfills a customer need. Now I need to further define the word cheap. Buying new cheap tools can mean the difference between success and failure, and perhaps even wanting to continue in the craft. I remember way back when, when I had an old big box hand plane, and it was horribly out of tune, and I didn't know how to fix it. This obviously was before YouTube was around, so I tried to sharpen it, but it absolutely did not work, and it soured me on hand planes for many, many years. And hand planes are one of the most fun tools to use in the shop when it's working correctly. One last point on buying cheap versus expensive tools that I watched on YouTube by Inspire Woodcraft. That point is usability. They both get the job done, but more expensive tools have better usability. Usability is in direct proportion to the price in almost all cases. For example, you can buy small clamps at various places for a couple of bucks each. Or you can buy Bessie clamps for three to four times as much. They both clamp, but the Bessies don't slip. The pad protectors don't come off and get lost. The handles are bigger and give you better grip. And the fit and finish are worlds apart. Those additional features are worth the price in many instances. One last point on tools. I seem to subscribe to the three version rule. I think it's my idea, but maybe other woodworkers realize this as well. Over the years, I end up buying a lot of things three times. I started with a shopsmith with most of the accessories. It had a bandsaw, a jointer, a table saw, lathe, and a drill press. I've since retired my shopsmith to being just a lathe and bought a Rikon bandsaw, which I use now but I know I'll be buying another bandsaw at some point in the future for resawing and to better suit my needs. Plus changing blades on a bandsaw can be as much of a pain as resawing a board with a handsaw. Chisels? I started with big box chisels way back when. I now have a set of Stanley Sweetheart chisels for everyday use, but I would love to have a good set of Japanese chisels. I bought some used Japanese chisels at a tool sale a few years ago, 
but the quality was not very good because they were brittle and they chipped. So buying inexpensive tools has its drawbacks. Knowing what I know now, I should have bought a set of Lee Nielsen or Lee Valley chisels or a quality set of Japanese chisels in the first place and been done with it. Yes, they are expensive, but how much money have I spent on all my other chisels, including the butt chisels I never use and bought because they were on sale? But hindsight is 2020, hence the three version rule. By the way, the Guild Academy will cover basic power tools in March, basic hand tools in June, hand planes and chisels in July, and sharpening in August. So please join us. If you've been woodworking, there may be times when you just can't get motivated to get in the shop. So what are some strategies that you can use? 731 Woodworks says to start your day the right way. Don't wake up in bed and immediately check the social media on your smartphone. In other words, don't start looking at other people's lives before you start yours. He also says to celebrate your wins in life, even the small ones. Writing down your goals of what you want to accomplish in woodworking is always a good idea and getting an accountability partner will help you stay focused on your goals that you've set. He also says that you can't take the next step until you've done the first. Those are some good words of advice. One thing I do is set a schedule for myself. Depending on what I'm working on, I create a daily work schedule on my phone of what I need to work on and what time I need to get started. And it reminds me, and it works terrific. So I guess I have two accountability partners, my wife and my phone. What are some strategies that you can use to be more productive once you're in the shop? Most woodworkers spend more time working on their shop than building furniture or making projects, and that's perfectly fine. But when we say we've been working on a project for six months, but what we truly mean is that we actually spent five and a half months of that time not working on it, we need to find some solutions. And here's a short list from Mike Pekovich. Have a shop mindset. Don't bring your outside mindset to your shop. If we rush and are frustrated or stressed or preoccupied with events outside of the shop, all of that is transferred into what we're making in the shop. If we are fighting a dull tool or stepping around clutter, it all shows up in the finished project. If we have the proper mindset, it will show up in the finished project. Make shop time matter. Whatever you do, do it well. From sweeping the floor to emptying the dust collector, from sharpening to making a finger joint jig, you'll find that doing each of these things well will quickly get you into the flow that leads to a productivity and satisfaction in your shop. Tune up your shop. A sharp tool, a tuned machine, an ordered shop creates an environment and a mindset where you can do good work and enjoy doing it. Set your priorities. Ask if what you're working on is the most important project. For myself, putting on my shop apron and making sure everything is in its place seems to help me get in the mood and get started. Mark Adams warns of paralysis by analysis. Have you ever suffered from trepidation of the first cut? I have. Are you afraid of making mistakes? I am. To solve it, you need to know your layout. You don't get rid of your reference line and remember to transfer them if necessary before the next step and make test cuts to gain confidence. Another reason to buy extra wood. Just like the apprentice programs I spoke of earlier where they learn by observation and practice, you too must learn the same way in order to be productive. There are also strategies for building projects, all of which we will cover in detail in a later Guild Academy class. Pay attention to the grain when selecting lumber and breaking out parts by having a clear idea about where to cut or not to cut the joinery. Have a system for organizing and marking your parts. Understand the difference between exact and equal and let the project dictate the dimensions called relative dimensioning. Think while you work. Sometimes I stand around for five or 10 minutes thinking. Instead, think while doing mundane tasks like putting away tools or cleaning up. Find a tempo that works for you. You don't get something done by rushing. 
It's maintaining a deliberate pace that work progresses at its fastest. Personally, I have learned to not work when I'm tired. It's best to stop and get a good night's rest and start out fresh in the morning. I trust that this class was beneficial to everyone watching, especially for the new woodworker and woodworkers who want to get to the next level. I know you can get better every day that you're in the shop. If you're not a member, take a few minutes to check out our website. If you'd like to join the guild, the cost is only $50 a year, and it supports a wide range of benefits, including patron sponsor discounts. As a member, you'll become part of a community that serves through education and fellowship. Thank you for watching.